Tilt the camera. It's not that bad. Look, look over there. Okay. You can kind of see it pretty well. Okay. Let me see. You just need the tilt. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, which lights? They're the glare. Probably look better, right? The light. Which ones? This one. Push it back towards dark. Push what back? You want this? Push this back? Here. It's good online. He said it's good online. You Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Welcome back. Inshallah, uh, we'll continue our uh, lecture. Uh, there's a lot to discuss, of course. Uh, does anyone remember the title of my lecture? <laughs> so, so it was the a diary of an Arabic nerd. <laughs> I said uh, TMI on one of the most uh, fascinating languages on on the in the world um so last last week if you'll recall we talked a lot about the history of the the semitic languages and in particular arabic we talked about um you know i guess how it's considered a proto-semitic language we talked about different theories and we also talked about uh the script a little bit uh today uh what i want to uh discuss and what we'll, we'll probably be discussing a lot, maybe this week and next week, is the significance of the Arabic language. Why? Why is it important that we study the language and that we, you know, get into the nitty gritty of the language? And this is kind of an overview, but I hope it'll inspire particularly some of you young people uh, to actually pursue Arabic language into high proficiency because we need more people with those skills. And, and I'll sh show you why for many different reasons. Um, so, can we see this okay? I know it's cut off a little bit. Okay. okay you can still get the whole thing, but anyway. Um, so the significance of the Arabic language. Um, as we know, there's many significances. And um, actually, <laughs> before, before we begin, does anyone know what this image is? I have, a, I have a free book for anyone that can tell me what this image is. OK? Okay, yeah, they're, they're hieroglyphics. Do you see anything else? You see some Arabic? Okay, does anyone know who, who, who wrote this or who, who did this? <laughs> no, no, that was before their, their time. <laughs> or just after their time. Uh, but uh, okay, we'll, we'll talk about it a little in, a, in, in a moment or two. So what are the significances of the Arabic language? Uh, from my point of view, um, it, is, it is a language that has preserved and disseminated knowledge, particularly from the ancient world into the, the modern world. Uh, it's a case study for other Semitic languages, particularly Hebrew. Uh, it's the liturgical language of Islam and some other religions. 
Uh, what does liturgical mean? Yeah, used in uh, um, religious rituals. And then, um, of course, it was the lingua franca of the known world, particularly the, the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, prior to English. So if, if we really think about the hegemony of Arabic language, you know, let's say gen generously, you can say that it was at least a thousand years that the Arabic language was used as a lingua franca in, in written works and uh, um, a language of knowledge throughout the Eastern Hemisphere. And if you compare that to English, English generously, we can say, has about 200 years as the, the a world language, right? And we know that Arabic has stored, you know, millennia of knowledge and only a small fraction of that, that uh, information has really even been printed into Arabic, printed into Arabic alone, uh, never mind, you know, translated it into, into English. Um, so first let's talk a little bit about Hebrew. Uh, I don't know if any of you are aware that tomorrow is Holocaust Awareness Day, and so I see it be fitting for us to talk a little bit about <laughs> the Hebrew language uh, in relation to Arabic. Um, so last week, uh, I, ma I made a controversial comment that I didn't elaborate on, uh, and I said, I, I don't think Hebrew is a real language. <laughs> and part of the reason why I think that is because uh, Hebrew um, is it's an ancient language, or it's considered an ancient language, that ceased to be spoken uh, pretty much altogether by the fourth century uh, of this common era, CE. Um, and even before that, it had been dying for quite a while as a spoken language. Uh, Hebrew uh, became exchanged for the Aramaic language uh, during the Babylonian captivity of the Israelites. So that was, what's that, seventh century BCE? So, you know, it's well over uh, 2,000 years. It's about uh, a couple of, uh, about 3,000 years or so, or maybe less, that, um, that Hebrew really stopped to be, ceased to be spoken commonly among the, the Israelites. So what is this language that people are speaking in, uh, the modern day is Israel, uh, it's a reconstructed Hebrew. And this was uh, started by Eliezer uh, ben Yehuda, uh, who was kind of a, a, I don't know how to put him, but he was a nationalist of sorts. Um, and he wanted to uh, sort of revive the Hebrew language. And there's been many attempts throughout history to revive the Hebrew language. But in the mid 19th century, so last century, uh, he tried to uh, reconstruct the Hebrew language um, based off of you know, literature and the Bible, um, but it was pretty much a pigeon tongue. What's the pigeon? What's the definition of a pigeon? It's like when uh, Tucker, if I, if I remember correctly, a pigeon is, is like when two people don't speak different languages and they don't understand each other, then they start to develop like a new language in order to uh, communicate. Yeah, it's like a broken language. It's like a broken language. So if I speak Arabic and you speak English, and we, I, we'll find some, we have type, find some type of way to, com to communicate. And these things that we, these ways we find to communicate will become like a new language, right? So they use that like it's pidgin language. Yeah. That's what they say. So, um, so basically Hebrew, uh, between these different uh, Jewish groups that, that you know, spoke Yiddish, they spoke Arabic, they spoke German and other languages. Uh, when they got together, they kind of spoke this pidgin uh, language. Um, and then later on, uh, the Hebrew Language Council, they devised a way to uh, fill in the gaps in the Hebrew language. And where did they pull from? None other than Arabic. Okay, so uh, they actually use Arabic, among other Semitic languages, to reconstruct Hebrew. And even modern Hebrew, a lot of the common 
the, the um, day to day terms are based on Arabic. So um, in that regard, I don't see uh, Hebrew as a real language. It's reconstructed. And, and there's some other historical reasons why I think that as well. But uh, I'll digress and talk a little bit more about, yes, sir, is there a question? Okay. <laughs> so we know that Arabic is the language of religion, um, particularly the religion of Islam. And there are several verses in the Quran that talk about you know, the Quran being an Arabic book. This is an Arabic revelation, al-hukum uh, arabi, and, and so on, right? <clears throat> Are there any other religions that use Arabic as a liturgical language? Mm. <laughs> I think uh, Coptic Christianity, um, they, they, they stopped using um, their native language, maybe like, uh, in the 13th century. Uh, sorry, uh, I just need to take a phone call. So, Yes, so uh, continuing where uh, Maurice left off, <clears throat> that how there's many ayahs in the Quran which talk about the Quran being an Arabic Quran, right? So that you may understand. So when we speak about Arabic here, we understand that the essence of the message is in Arabic. Although you can translate the Quran into English, but it's not considered the Quran as we all know, but you could translate the general message in, uh, into other languages. But as for the precise understanding, as for the essence, uh, that could only be understood in Arabic language. And this is the reason why you see around the world why different when different people accepted Islam, they hastened to learn Arabic language because they understood this. And, and, and quite uh, before modern times, you know, translation wasn't as common as it is now. So whereas here, you know, there's many translations of Arabic books into English and uh, Hadith or Fiqh or Quran or uh, Aqidah, any subject. But prior, prior to, uh, let's say, 70 years, even I'm pretty sure in some of you guys' times, there was no translation, right? And this was the case around the world, no matter where you went. So people were forced, people were forced to learn the Arabic language, not only for religious purposes, but as Marie said, the way English is now around the world, where it's the lingua franca, it's the language of business, right? It's the language of the, the petrol uh, dollar or the oil. Arabic was like that for a thousand years, not 200, a thousand years. So we have examples of uh, even Europeans that wanted to study medicine, even Europeans that wanted to study uh, or wanted to become uh, politically relevant. They had to learn Arabic. This is a fact. Even in the, the you had in Spain, right? Where you had uh, Islamic Spain, Al-Andalus. And Al-Andalus, was a place of advancement, a place of knowledge, a place of uh, religious scholarship, to the point where the other Europeans from France, from all over Europe, will have to come to Spain, have to learn Arabic first, and then they will have to, they wanted to study, wanted to study medicine, they wanted to study uh, science, any modern knowledge at the time required a, a learning of Arabic. So also here you see that Arabic wasn't restricted to a religious language. It was the language of the world. To the point where you had like Aristotle, uh, Socrates, these ancient philosophers, they, their works were lost in Europe. They were able to get their works coming out of translating their works from Arabic back into uh, English or back into Latin or back into Greek. To the point where uh, I don't know, you, I don't know if you're familiar with Ibn Sina, but Ibn Sina was an Arab philosopher. He was he had a book called the Shifat. It was a book in medicine. This book in medicine was studied for 500 years in Europe. It was the standard medical textbook for medical students in Italy, right? In uh, you know France, 
in all of the European places, this was the, the standard. Do you, have, you ever, have you guys ever heard of Ibn Rushd? Ibn Rushd, uh, for those who study Islamic studies, there's a book, Bidai to Mujtahid. It's like a comparative fiqh book that they study even in Medina. But this Ibn Rushd, he wrote commentaries on Aristotle's works, right? To the point where when, um, when, Europe, when, when, when Aristotle was translated back into European languages, they would study Aristotle's works with the commentaries of Ibn Rushd, a philosopher, a jurist from Spain. His commentaries of Aristotle were relied upon for hundreds of years. So even Christians that studied philosophy in Christian seminaries, they used to study Aristotle through Ibn Rushd commentaries. This is how, you know, so even when we look at Western advancement, you have to understand, look, think about this. Columbus, I'm going to let you go because now I'm going off on a, a little rant here, but it's very important for us to understand this. 1492, that's when Columbus famously, supposedly, you know, discovered the new, the new world, right? That same year, does anyone know what, was, what else happened in 1492? The Spanish Inquisition in the same exact year where they pushed the Muslims out of Spain. So when the Spanish came to the New World, were you, what, who do you think they were studying from prior? Right? So when we talk about transmission of knowledge, the transmission, really, the West started to you know, gain power again by inheriting many works from the Arabic language. And you can look at this historically. So even when we talk about the Arabic language, this is a language that was spoken in uh, Arabia and Yemen by desert people to become the language of the world. This was the power of the Arabic language by desert people. This same language, the Ummah, the Prophet Sallallahu they was inspired by the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba spread through amongst the world. And from there, wherever Islam went, the Arabic language went, and it enriched civilizations. So, you know, when we look at um, Western dominance now, you have to study the lifeline of ideas. The lifeline, like, like we have a life, ideas have a life too. Where did intellectual history, right? In the inter intellectual genealogy, right? So this is just in a nutshell, uh, you know, some of the importance, importance talking about the importance of the Arabic language. And we, there's a lot more to say, but I'm going to hand the uh, microphone back to uh, Maurice. <laughs> so, so it's very, very interesting. We'll get into Ibn Rushd. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know if any of you have actually read some of the Islam and the Ancient Mysteries book, but I talk about um, I talk about the, the pivotal role that Ibn Rushd played in transmitting, um, I guess, what we call the ancient sciences uh, into Europe. But before we talk about that, I have a question for everyone here and for people online and so on. Uh, is Islam an Arab religion? So we know, you know, these, from these Quranic verses that it seems like there is a close relationship between Islam the religion and the Arabic language. And we know that this question is usually uh, geared towards uh, African-American uh, Muslims and Muslims of African origin. Uh, for some reason, it doesn't extend to people of Asian origin <laughs> or, or um, Turkish origin who make up the majority of, uh, of Muslims in the world. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are. and. Uh, Anyone who wants to talk, uh, yes, sir. That the religion is Hanifan. Yes, sir. That's what much my point. Okay. Uh, that the religion is is named in 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 the Quran as Hanifan. So not Islam. I don't know. I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm asking you all: Is Islam an Arab religion? <laughs> Not exclusively Arab religion, it's religion of humanity. 
Arabs. So it's a religion of mankind, not just Arabs, Arabs or uh, non-Arabs. It's a religion of humanity. That's, it's, that's the religion. Bismillah. I would say it's not an Arab religion based on um, the, uh, the makeup of the adherence to the religion, which are in, uh, Indonesian. And as far as I know, in terms of the numbers, so based on solely on the numbers, I wouldn't say that it is an it is an Arab religion. And when the ayahs in the Quran it says Ya Ayuhannas, right? Oh mankind. So that covers a big law. Uh, that covers everything, doesn't it? Question <laughs> is Islam. Is Islam is Arab? Yeah, it's Islam an Arab religion. No, Islam is not an Arab religion because uh, Islam was given to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the for the mankind, for the entire world. <laughs> okay, I'll get the one of the brothers in the back to comment. Yes, Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. I would say no. It says it's revealed in Arabic so that you may understand. That's my understanding. Okay. So, so um, I, I do think this this question is is pertinent um, because it, it's used a lot of times um, as a trope, particularly against African and African American Muslims, uh, dark skinned Muslims, I, and. As we've seen in the Quran, you know, there is this close association between the Arabic language and, um, and Islam. And, and someone might say that uh, the fact that the, the, the Quran is in the, the Arabic language and that, you know, in order to be, you know, well versed or, you know, considered a leader, thought leader or anything of that nature, in Islam, you have to have some sort of proficiency in the Arabic language. So that gives Arabs a supremacy within the, within the, the religion. Um, what do you all think? <laughs> I mean, I have some questions to kind of bounce off. <laughs> I know you, you're about to think, uh-oh. <laughs> there you go. As the prophet said, he said to love Arab, I said, I'm Arab. The Quran came in Arabic. And then he said, uh, the Jannah, we're going to be speaking Arabic, right? Yeah. yeah. And also, uh, during his last uh, sermon, he said, uh, there's no black superior to white or white superior to, and Arab superior to other things like that. That means, uh, uh, we're not saying specifically is uh, Arabic uh, uh, religion because the Prophet Muhammad, like he said, he come for human kind and gene. That means it's not specifically for Arabs. Uh, what was the second part of your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just making the point that uh, someone can argue that um, because the, the Quran is an Arabic language and in order to study all these texts and things like that, you need some sort of proficiency in the Arabic language. So doesn't that give people who speak Arabic as a native tongue some sort of su supremacy within the religion? Well, well, just as Bilal said, I don't uh, say that there's any any uh, that being Arab, like you can quote the last the last sermon, gives you any preference. Number one, Islamically, I mean, anything like that. Whether you because you speak the language. Whether that gives you a preference, if you're born with the tongue, maybe or maybe not. Because again, uh, many of the Arabs now don't speak the Fusha. And that's what the Quran came and it's the Fusha. So they speak some Arabic, 
but do they, you know, do they really understand? <laughs> yeah, big, more so than somebody else who doesn't have a native language. Okay. So it's whatever law gives you. And also, the Arab are 10% of the Islamic Ummah, right? Yeah. And that means uh, it's not... It's not uh, Arab religion. It's uh, for the whole humanity. Okay. Do, do we have any uh, Arabs that want to retort? <laughs> no? <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, of course my answer would be no, Islam is not an Arab religion uh, per se, but there, there is some preference. We, we, we have to acknowledge that there is some preference given to the Arabic language. Um, and anyone who's been in um, countries or per particular places where uh, you know, Arabic is studied intently. So not just the country itself, but in centers where, you know, that attract a lot of uh, students from all over the world. They study Sharia, they study Arabic language and other things. Um, you, you know that the interest in the Arabic language, particularly Fusha, classical Arabic, you know, it comes from foreigners, uh, so to speak, non-Arabs. Uh, and like, like uh, the brother over here mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of these centers are full of Indonesians, Malaysians, <laughs> more than, you know, anyone else just about. Um, so just to, to retort to this accusation that, that, that uh, Islam is, is an Arab religion, I have some questions. Hopefully, we'll explore some of these. Who is an Arab? Well, one definition that I uh, understand is uh, that whoever speaks Arabic is Arab. You know, who will to call them Arabi, who are Arab. That's one definition uh, that uh, uh, I think it comes from the you know Islamic tradition. Now and then, um, as far as uh, ethnically, um, that's that's another <laughs> issue, you know. But I think it's more so with with uh, there's Arab tribes, there's people who who are Arabic uh, by ethnicity, there's Arabic by tongue. I remember one of the khutbah, uh, the Imam was saying, there's the people who become Arab, but they were not originally Arab. Yeah. Uh, there's, I believe there's another definition of which I've seen in books where uh, they describe the Arabs as people who reside in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, those residents or people who actually reside there, they have listed them as the Arabs, according to some, some books that I've seen. But these books, again, are written by Westerners, so. Okay. <laughs> Arab speakers? No, you want to take a shot at it? <laughs> That's my native language. I was born over there, so I think I'm an Arab because I was born over there. My native language is an Arab. And I think I have a, an advantage over non-speaking Arabic. That's the difference between me and him. For being as uh, the Islam is was sent for the mankind or just for the Arab themselves. So I think it's for the mankind. For That's for the first question you, uh, you ask for. But uh, I have an advantage over him because I speak it. I understand it more than he does. That's, I think, what it is. Okay. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <clears throat> so, so who is an Arab? Um, you want to take on this question? <laughs> it's hard to really say. 
Um, I think I would prefer the definition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said whoever speaks Arabic, you know, and they speak it fluently, they speak it, then they are Arab. I think that's the, because ethnically, it's really hard to say anyone who's really outside of Yemen per se, or Saudi, then it's, most people have been Arabicized, like one of the brothers mentioned, because if you go during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the Arabs went to North Africa, you know, Arabic was not spoken in Morocco or was not spoken in, from what I understand, you have Amazigh, you know, the, yeah, so people became, people took on the tongue, they learned Arabic and then, you know, maybe they mixed, maybe they have mixed blood, but it's really, it's not an easy question to answer. And I guess uh, sort of to put it simply, I would actually compare the Arab identity to the Latino identity um, because there's a linguistic and cultural um, affiliation there. Although we know that they have, you know, different local cultures and some of them even have different local languages, uh, but they all speak uh, Spanish as a as a uh, native tongue. And similarly, you know, prior to that, Persian was one of those languages. So it was throughout uh, Central Asia, uh, even non-Persian people spoke Persian. Um, so in the same way, Arabic, you know, it spread, you know, throughout, you know, uh, pretty much ancient Byzantium. And I think that's very interesting. Um, that it, it spread to the same places that used to be the Roman Empire. Um, and they kind of consolidated uh, under the, the religion of Islam and the Arabic language, uh, but mostly the Arabic language, even because there's, um, there's non-Muslim groups, you know, Coptic, Christians, and various Christian groups throughout the Levant and so on. Um, how did Arabic sp spread? Uh, okay, what is the relationship between Arabs and Islam. So, I mean, this is kind of a historical question. <laughs> so, so uh, of course, we know uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was an Arab, the early Sahaba, most of them were Arabs. And when they um, um, would do, the, do these um, uh, wars of conquest, uh, they would, they would, they would spread throughout the world, but the Arabic language didn't, you know, just, you know, it didn't uh, take over immediately. There's a long process, and I don't think we all often uh, appreciate this history enough, that there was a long process of Arabization in places like Egypt, in places like Algeria, places like Morocco. Um, you know, Arabic just didn't appear overnight, and there's many different, way, many different reasons as to why people actually adopted the, the language. Um, and, and we know, that, as uh, Brother Najib has said, everywhere that Islam spread to, the Arabic language spread to. But not everyone became Arabs, right? So I, mean, I think this is a very interesting historical question. Why did the Persians not become so this is a like you said, uh, you know, uh, this is a good question for us to think about as people who are studying Islam, who are trying to learn Arabic to get closer to Allah, to be able to recite the Kitabullah. You learn in Arabic. This is a very interesting point because if you think about certain countries where Islam spread, right, Morocco, uh, Mauritania, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Maldives. Syria, Maldives, Djibouti, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, all of these places, Sudan, all of these places adopted the Arabic language as the language to be spoken in the country. But how come places like Malaysia, Indonesia, Pakistan, Iran, Senegal, Mali, they became fully Muslim places as well, but they didn't adopt the Arabic language as everyday spoken? You see what I'm saying? So this is an interesting question. Why did some societies adopt the Arabic language as their native tongue and other Arab and other Muslim countries didn't. 
there's no clear answer to it, this but is yes, I mean, but it's very interesting something to think about. Because if, if you take the case of Africa, for example, before the uh, Islam came, it was a civilization, it was a culture, it was a lot of languages, I even say tribal language. That means it was difficult for one language, Arabic, to come and wipe all this. Uh, because if you take one country, for example, you can see 10 people can stand and speak, they don't understand each other. That means it's a multiplicity of uh, languages and culture in it before the Arab. Then now uh, it's only Islam came now, all of us are geared to learn Arabic for the sake of uh, the religion. Yes. Yes, Salaam Alaikum. Yeah, um, Islam came to refine cultures. It didn't necessarily come to change cultures. It refined them. It got rid of the bad and it kept the good. And most of those countries survived like that. So some of them kept the Arabic language. Some of them just retained their language and they moved on. Yeah. And I, I think uh, that kind of plays into the next question. How did Arabic spread to non-Arab populations? Um, well, that's a mixed bag of, as well. Um, in some places, it spread, it did kind of spread to, through uh, conquest, um, but conquest cannot keep a, a, a people in the language. Trade, trade routes. Um, Education. In fact, one of the, the first papers I did for my, my uh, last master's degree, uh, I studied um, how the educational system in, the, uh, in Tunisia in particular um, spread the Arabic language and also the Maliki Madhab in the Maghrib. <coughs> and this is a very interesting history because, you know, at the time, you know, there was all sorts of groups and, and sects uh, of Islam, uh, nothing out of the ordinary, right? There was, you know, there was Berbers that claimed to be prophets and, you know, they had this anti-Arab sentiment. Uh, there was a lot of things, you know, the Mu'tazilites were there and, you know, various different groups were in the, in, in the Maghrib at the time, but through education, particularly Arabic education, studying the Quran, people kind of slowly started to calm down <laughs> and they, uh, you know, they, they would read the Quran and then eventually they adopted the, the Arabic language, even though a lot of these people, they were Christians beforehand. We don't even know that there was, there was lots of Christians in, uh, in Algeria, Libya, and places like this. In fact, um, one of the, the greatest uh, Christian, early Christian writers, um, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, he was from current day Algeria. Um, and, and many of them were from Alexandria, and Egypt, and so on. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's a cultural continuity through these uh, places that were in uh, Byzant Byzantium. Um, and they, they were very intellectual as well. I think I guess under Islam, they were able to really sort of uh, revive that intellectualism uh, through the Arabic languages. Okay, list the Arab calif ca caliphs and dynasties. Why is that important? <laughs> because. Yeah, well, well, when was the last time there was an Arab caliph? It was really during the time of maybe the Umayyads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When was yeah? I mean, during the Abbasid, they became more Persian, you know. So, uh, and since the fall of the Ab Abbasid Empire, there there really haven't been any. What's that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh huh. So he switches the Umayyads. So okay, yeah, Spain. yeah, they kind of revived the Umayyads in Spain. 
Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Inshallah. That's interesting. That's a, interesting yeah. thing. That's a yeah. That's another can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But okay, okay, the brother's gonna call it Adan. Bismillah. Inshallah. Inshallah. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Ashhadu la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu la Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah Hayy alayhi Hai alayhi salam Hai alayhi salam Hai alayhi salam Allah Akbar Allah La ilaha illallah. Should I continue just for a couple of minutes? Okay, inshallah. Um, and this kind of brings us to, to the last question, uh, which is really the, the crux of what I'm trying to get at here, is that uh, if we ask how many Islamic scholars throughout the centuries were Arab, uh, we'll find a very small percentage of people that were like purely Arab. Sure. Um, and so like, for instance, all, a lot of the, the major contributions the Arabic language to the Islamic studies and things like that, they were done by non-Arabs. Um, and they, they just, what's that? And they simply wrote in Arabic. Um, so uh, for instance, even like one of the, uh, the earliest and probably most authoritative grammatical works was written by Sibaway, a Persian who, who, who was laughed out of the, the, the scholarly circles because you know he he didn't know Arabic properly, he went back and did his studies, and he wrote uh, a book Al Kitab, which endures to this day. Um, I mean, Ghazali, for instance, he was a Persian. Um, Al Bukhari, he was a Persian. Yes, they they spoke multiple languages, and <clears throat> but they wrote. Uh, in the common language and the lingua franca of the time of the era that we are still in, which is the, the era of uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Islam. And um, before I, I move on just a little bit, would you like to? Yeah, uh, about this uh, contribution to scholarship, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm gonna keep it brief. 
is that even when you look at all of the uh, hadith books from Bukhari to Muslim to Nisa'i, Ibn Majah, Abu Dawood, um, all of them were Persians. All of the six major six hadith collections. And I'm missing somebody, Tirmidhi. Imam Tirmidhi, Rahimahumullah. All of them were Persians, meaning they spoke Persian and Arabic. They were bilingual. Or maybe multi Abu Hanifa. Persian was his native tongue. Like imagine this. This is this is of this is from the Salaf. You think about this, the Salaf, right? People who met, some of the people who met the Sahaba or met the students of the Sahaba. Amongst them were giants that this religion cannot do without. But you could say at the very least they were bi they were bilingual, many of them. Sibuwe, like he says, right? The book Al Kitab in Nahu. It's the it's the it's the it's the most authoritative uh, book in Arabic grammar. Like you said, Imam Bukhari. I mean, that's enough. You know, Rahimhumullah, who was a Persian, who was born in Uzbekistan, modern day Uzbekistan. Right? And Imam Muslim and all of these uh six uh, hadith collectors. And think about this, right? We have the six books of hadith by Persians. We have Abu Hanifa, Rahimullah, whose method is the largest in the world. The largest. Coming from a Persian man who started studying Islam later in life. He didn't, he wasn't one of the uh, students of knowledge who came up at six, seven, eight years old studying Islam. He was a businessman before he became a scholar. So many of these scholars had to make, make effort, effort. The point is they had to make effort in learning Arabic well. So this shows you, you know, and Arabic is the only language that I know of where non-Arab people became the masters and codifiers of that language. I don't know any other language like this, where, where non-Arabs uh, non became the imams of the language, even the dictionaries. So Arabic as a universal language. And the last thing I'm gonna say, even when, like uh, I think Sheikh Shamsuddin mentioned this, well, he said that, um, you know, um, you know, re re revealed it in Arabic that you may understand. So Arabic is, is linked to what? Understanding, not ethnicity. And it, well, so what does that actually essentially is saying to you? Is that it's equal opportunity. It's equal opportunity. It's not because you're Arab or not Arab, it's because it's the language of understanding. And I think that was an interesting point that he brought up earlier. It's, 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 it uh, stuck with me. What question? It, it seems to be significant also that Arabic, as with the Arabs themselves, was basically a spoken language as opposed to a written language. So the Arabs themselves, as a collective, weren't writers, from what I see. Okay, they weren't writers. So these other civilizations, Persian, others, they all had written, have civilizations. So I think that may be one of the differences. Too. Interesting. <laughs> so uh, that is true. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, very quickly with this one slide. So we know that Arab, Arabic is a vessel of knowledge. And I want to just sort of very briefly walk through this history. It's cut off a little bit. So the, the, the first one over here says, um, like, pretty much from the 9th to the 13th centuries, works from uh, ancient Greece, uh, Egypt, slash Egypt, uh, Persia, slash Babylon, and India were translated into Arabic. Okay. This is something that we have to really sort of hone in on that um, the works of the ancient world, the ancient world um, were all translated into Arabic. Uh, so that means all the works of Aristotle and you know the Persian works and things like that, 
they all sort of took form in the Arabic language. And then at some point in their <laughs> existence, you know, those original works ceased to exist. Um, and then uh, various, various fields of knowledge. Okay, so it was written in, they, they, they took various fields of knowledge, uh, ancient, the ancient sciences, what they call the uluma uh, al-aqliya, or uluma al-qudama, philosophy, the empirical sciences, like, you know, botany and uh, chemistry and so on, as well as the occult sciences. I know that's a little bit controversial, <laughs> but Muslims did it all, basically. <laughs> and then they also transmitted, they, they used the, the transmitted sciences, which we call the ulum and naqliya, um, or, or the humanistic sciences. And these all had a relationship to um, pretty much the religion and the language. So, of course, all the different sciences of the Arabic language, we'll talk about later on, uh, hadith, history, or they call it akhbar, uh, jurisprudence, the soul of everything having to do with Islam and everything was, was here. Um, and, and this is actually cataloged in an, um, there's a work called the catalog uh, or al-fihrist by Ibn Nadim, who was kind of like a, a bookseller in Bag Baghdad for, um, and I think he is in the third or um, fourth century. And he cataloged all the books that he would be selling at the time. And a lot of these books are no longer extant. But you see in his catalog that he, that there is a lot of uh, books that people were reading very early on in Islamic history. E even though they say that the first two centuries, the first two or three centuries of Islam, there was no real reading or writing. But Ibn Nadim, his, his work um, refutes that, that position. Yes, sir. And then um, the compilation and development. Okay, the compilation and development of this knowledge was multi-ethnic. Okay, this is very important. It's a very important point, and this goes back to the idea: Oh, what is, is, is uh, Islam an Arab religion? So it, it was a multi-ethnic, actually multi-religious. An intergenerational and, and transcontinental movement of knowledge, uh, of, of research, uh, not just translation, research as well, into these various sciences. And so it, it, it actually just doesn't belong to Islam. Um, I know that's a little bit controversial, um, but you know, many, many uh, religious groups played a role. In, in contributing to Arabic knowledge, to knowledge that was written in Arabic. Uh, and of course, it's multi-ethnic, which we were just talking about. There's lots of Persians and you know, Uzbeks and all sorts of people we probably never heard of. Um, and it didn't just occur in one generation. It was transgenerational, pretty much a millennium worth of knowledge, and it still continues to this day. Uh, and it spanned, you know, Asia, Africa, uh, Europe. And I know we're about to pray, so the last point, uh, even in Africa, because we talk about the relationship between Arabic and Africa, look, you have, like you said, we talk about this all the time, even in Timbuktu, there's over 500,000 manuscripts. We're and Mali, manuscripts. That's the next one. we're going to get to this next time. 500,000 manuscripts written in what language? Arabic. Not only did they study religion, they wrote their histories in Arabic. Right? They wrote their family, family lineages in Arabic. This is in Africa. And you can find these type of manuscripts in every continent, wherever Islam went. So we thank everyone for coming. We benefited from the responses. We want to make this an interactive class. So we urge people that may be online to come in class, get some of the battle cat that we all are learning together. And I'll see you next week, inshallah. Thank you for coming. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Jazakum Allah Khair for the participation. Oh, <laughs> I gotta get used to this. <laughs> I don't like this kind of thing. <laughs>